Loving Father, we just want to recording wanna, in progress. We just want to thank you so much for another day of life that you have granted us, and for another privilege where we can open up your word. And we are just praying, Lord, that as we seek to understand truth, as we seek to understand more about the third person of the Godhead, we are just praying, may you show us our great need of him. Show us, Lord, the necessity of forsaking sin. And I really just plead, Lord, may the truths that we study just make deep impressions upon our hearts and minds and may it create within our hearts a hunger and a thirst of the righteousness. Please, may you bless us. May these truths be simple that the weakest of minds can understand them. And please, may you win our affections away from sin and fix them upon Jesus. Please bless everyone that is present and even those who will be viewing the study later on. Please, Lord, make deep impressions and may the truth sanctify our hearts and make us like Jesus. We love you, Father, and we ask these mercies humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to do, because I realized that we did not complete our study on the Holy Spirit, so we're going to just touch on a few points. We're not going to be long. It's going to be a short study. We're just going to resume. We're going to continue where we stopped in our last study. We remember in our last study we were looking and we saw that in order for us to be saved, can, let's just do a small review. Can we remember in order for us to be saved, what is the process of salvation? Like if you would meet someone on the street and they would speak to you and they would say, um, my brother, my sister, I would like salvation. I would like to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What is the means by which I must enter into the kingdom of heaven? What would you tell them based upon our last study? What, what, what would be your answer to that person? If they say, I want to enter God's kingdom. Be, be born again. You must be born again. Sister Jen? Okay. So you must no. be... Amen. Now, what if the person says to you, you, whom you tell you must be born again, and they say to you this, that sounds wonderful, but how does this process take place? What would be your answer to that person? It's through the Holy Spirit convicting them and they being accepting that conviction, conviction and, you know, acting mm. upon it. Amen. Powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Michelle. Remember what Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 5? He says, except to be born of two things, of water and the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So he's explaining how does this process take place. You have to be baptized and you must be born of the Spirit. Now let me ask you, remember I asked the question on, when we studied the last study. Which one comes first? Is it baptism? If someone says, I want to be saved. I run quickly, get baptized. A salvation, do, do, I, do I get baptized first with water before baptism of the Spirit? Or is it baptism of the Spirit and then water? Which one comes first? Then water. Do you know that many people, do you know why there's so much problems in, our, in the church, both, I'm saying, in, just within Christendom? Because many people run to be baptized by water when they have not been baptized by the Spirit. And these people grow up within the church or they come into leadership positions and they start fighting against the truth. Why? Simply it means this man or this woman were not baptized by the Spirit. They have been baptized by water, that's true, but they have not been baptized by the Spirit. Sister Emma? And if they haven't been baptized by the Spirit, this means that they haven't been convicted. So it's just a physical act. Yes. Going in the water and coming back up. That's it. They go into the water as wet sinners, come out of the water as wet sinners. No, no change of life. No change of life. <laughs> now, what Jesus said concerning this process of being born again, remember what Nicodemus thought. Okay, Sister Keisha? just wondering wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been the holy spirit that have convicted that person to get baptized in the first place oh powerful question do you know that it is possible actually jesus spoke a parable you know what let me answer you with bible let me answer it bible come yo come with me to matthew 3 come with me to matthew chapter 3 Let, let's see let's see matthew 3 now I have to do, we, have, we don't have a long study, but we have to complete the study. And then if I've got some time, I will take some questions. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3. 
I want you to see who leads people to baptism. Someone might say God leads people to baptism. I can partially agree with that. But I can also tell you, I can affirm, uh, based on scripture, I can tell you Satan leads people to baptism as well. And I'm going to give you a, I would give you a quotation that will show you one of the greatest problems that the church is facing as unconverted people getting baptized. I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Now there was a man by the name of John the Baptist, verse, Matthew 3 verse 5. It says, then went, out, then went out to him Jerusalem. Talking about John, they went out to John. And all Judea and all the region round, round about Jordan. It says, verse 6, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Pause. Were people getting baptized by John? Yes. But they were also confessing their sins. They were confessing their sins, forsaking their sins. Now watch, the, watch what follows. It says, verse 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to him, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who had warned you to flee from the rod to come, bring forth therefore fruit meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of the stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Verse 10. And now also is the axe laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit, it is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now let's pause. Do you know what is happening here? Scribes, Pharisees are coming to be baptized by John. And what John calls them, he says, O oh, generation of vipers. He called them snakes. Why would he call them snakes? Because the great serpent is Satan. He said, you're the children of Satan. Who warned you to flee from the rod to come? So here we can see there were people coming for baptism, but God never lead them. John said, Satan has led you to come here. You are a generation of vipers. So it is possible for people to come for baptism, and it is not God that has moved them to be baptized. I hope that answers the question, Sister Keisha. Now, I want, us, I want us to see, I want us to see in John chapter 3, remember when Jesus was speaking, when, no, you know what, maybe before I continue, let me ask you a question. Let's just say there's someone you are doing Bible studies with and this person indicates I want to be baptized. Now, based upon your knowledge of what we have studied, what would you first try to see before you get him into that water? What would you first try to see? What would you first try to see? What I'm saying, if anyone wants to get baptized, do, should they just get baptized? Based upon this, did we see John refused to baptize people that came to him? He called them generation of vipers. He says, first, go bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Then he says, come, and then I will, you will be baptized. He says, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Then come and you get baptized. I'm saying, baptism of the water, is that, a, is that a part of being born again? Yes. But what must happen before baptism of the water? Conviction. Conviction? But what specifically Jesus says, they must be born of what? Water and the Spirit. And the Spirit. They must be born of the Spirit. Now, how would you know if a man or a woman has been born of the Spirit? How would you know that? They should confess. Sorry? They should confess. And, they should confess. Oh, right. Okay, they're but... Spirit in their life. They're showing Spirit in their life. Okay, my sister, you're breaking up. You said about the Spirit? They're showing fruits of the Spirit. In their life. Powerful, 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 powerful. They must have the fruits of the Spirit. Amen. Sister Emma? Which, just uh, touching on, adding to what Sister Cashel said, there must be a turning around 180 degrees, uh, 180 degrees of uh, the life mm, 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 Powerful. Yeah. Now, in John 3, in John chapter 3, Jesus says that in John 3, Jesus says, in verse 8, John 3 verse 8. In, I'm not going to read the verse, you can read it, but I'm going to just tell you what the verse says. In John 3 verses 8, Jesus is speaking about how a person is born again. How, how, how do you know if a man or woman is born again? 
He says, as the wind blows upon the tree, or as it blows, can anyone literally see wind? I'm saying, can you, when, can you literally see wind? Or can you see the effects of wind? You, you can only see the effects. Likewise, us, the Spirit of God is on planet Earth, according to Jesus. When he ascended, he said the Spirit is coming. So I cannot see him physically, but I can see the effects. Like, oh, I cannot see the wind physically, but I can see the effects when it's blowing on a tree. I can say there's wind. How? Because I can see its effects. Likewise, I cannot see the Spirit directly working in a man or woman's life, but I can see the effects. He used to drink, I see no more drinks. He used to smoke, he used to speak vulgar, he used to do all these funny things, all these sins. But as the Spirit of God starts, well, I can't see the Spirit doing it, but I look and I can see now the effects. Hey, the man is no more drinking. The man is no more swearing. The man is no more... And now I'm seeing evidence. I, can't, I never see the Spirit do the work, but I'm seeing evidence of the effect of the Spirit upon his life. That man, that woman testifies that they are being born again. It's a process. It's not boom. It's a process, a continual process, continual process. So this is what Jesus spoke to us about being born again, that this is the beginning of ent entrance into his kingdom. We must be born again. Now, what I want us to do very quickly, I want us to look, just I want to touch on this before I move on, because I'm going to tell you this, you're going to face these things. Those of, who, who are Adventists or those who are going to come into the Adventist church, we're all in different parts of the world. You're going to face this and I just want you to have the solid, solid ground for your feet. Solid ground for your feet. I'm just going to touch on it and then we're going to move on. Yes, Sister Emma? So this process of, um, this process of being born again of the Spirit being yes. a, a continual process is also called sanctification the process Powerful. of becoming holy, Powerful. and it is also it is mm. also imparted righteousness. Hey, oh, amen, amen. This is the Emma. You are speaking righteousness by faith. You know, friends, do you understand what Sister Emma said? Do you know there's so much confusion even within the remnant church? On just what she said, this is powerful. So there's no self. You know, Sister Emma, thank you so much. That is power. That is deep. That is deep. There's no salvation without sanctification. There's people who will teach you all you need is justification. You don't need nothing more. But Jesus says you must be born again. And it's the work of the Spirit to sanctify me. That's Romans. Actually, it's Romans chapter 15, I believe, verse 16, where Jesus says, or it's Romans 16, 15, where Jesus speaks, or Paul speaks specifically, and he says the work of the Spirit is to sanctify us. That's Romans 15, verse 16. Romans 15, verse 16. Now, what I want us to do, I want us to look um, very quickly just on something we touched before. Just on something we touched before. Um, come with me in your Bible to, to Job, Job 27. Job chapter 27. Job 27. Actually, did I say Job 27? Hmm. Actually, you know what? Let us first do this. Come with me in your Bible. We'll come back to Job. Come with me in your Bible. To Luke. Luke chapter 12. Hmm. Okay, I want us to look at Luke, the 11th chapter, rather. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. I want us to see Luke, the 11th chapter. Now, before I read Luke 11, I just want to ask a question. Can you remember when, we, when our very first study, we looked, at the we looked at creation? Can you remember in creation, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, we touched on it, that the Spirit of God have anything to do with the creation of this world? Yes, we saw you played a very active part in the creation of this world. Now, can anyone tell me what was the next major event? I'm saying that God done outside of creation. The next major event, it's in between creation and Calvary. It stands in between creation and Calvary. 
where God done something. Can anyone, the, the next major event that took place, it's in, in between creation and it's in between Calvary. God done something which he done once and he never do it again. Is it to destroy the world with water? Okay, but so that, that is a major event. But something he, has, he gave to the human family. Of the creation, the Ten, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Now, can you remember, based on our first study, who spoke those Ten Commandments? It was God, but which person of the Godhead? We looked at that. It was Jesus. Now, if you go to Exodus, you know what? Keep your finger here and look. I'm coming right back to look. I want you to see something with the second major event. You saw the first major event, the Spirit played a part. What about the second major event, the giving of the law? Did the Spirit of God play a part in the giving of the law? If he did play a part, that would make him also God. Now let's see. Come with me in your Bible to Exodus. I think it's Exodus 31. Let's see. Come with me to Exodus 31. Let's see when the Bible speaks about the law. When the Bible speaks about the law, I want us to see what does the Bible say concerning this law. Exodus chapter 31 verse, Exodus 31 verse 18. Now hear what the Bible says. Exodus 31 verse 18. It says, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communion with him, upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone. Take note, take note, written with the finger of God. Pause there, friends. If I had a board, I would write here the law of God, and then I would write, put a dash, I would say, the law of God came to the family, human family. How did it come to us? What did God use to write the law? Finger of God. So the law of God that on the tables of stone was written with the finger of God. Can we all agree with that, friends? That's crystal clear. God used, it says, the finger of God. Now my question is this. What is the finger of God? Now someone would say his finger, this <laughs> Let's see. What is the finger of God? Come with me in your Bible. Sorry? Come with me in your Bible now. Let's go to Luke 11. Luke chapter 11. I want you to see the Spirit plays a key role in everything that has to do with the human family, whether it's creation, whether it's the giving of the law, whether it's salvation, whatever you name it. He plays a key part. Friends, this, this is the, one of the most important truths for us is understanding the work of the Holy Spirit, not so much who he is. Silence is golden on that topic, who he is. But his work is of greatest importance. Luke chapter 11. Now, in Luke chapter 11, this is where Jesus uttered a warning against the, the, the sin, against the Spirit of God, because he was casting out demons, healing the sick. And they said that he does these miracles by Balsibab. That's the prince of the devils. And then Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. You're in danger of committing sin against the Holy Spirit. And then he says, I want you to see what Jesus says concerning what, hear what Jesus says about his miracles. In Luke 11 verse 20. Luke 11 verse 20. It says, but if I, Jesus speaking, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Question, what did Jesus use to cast out demons? According to Jesus' words, just what he said, just what Jesus says, what did he use? Sorry? The finger of God. So now I have to compare scripture with scripture. Let's go to the parallel passage. The parallel passage is Matthew 12. Now, Luke puts it, Jesus in Luke is the finger of God. But let's see how Matthew states the same thing. He says he cast out demons by the finger of God. But let's go now to Matthew's account of it. Let's see how does Jesus cast out demons. Luke says, finger of God. Let's see what Jesus says in Matthew, the 12th chapter. Matthew, chapter 12. Matthew, the 12th chapter. I want someone to read for us Matthew, chapter 12. We can start in verse... Start in verse... Verse, verse 20, 27, and then we'll read 28. We want 28, but can someone read for me from verse 27 and then 
28. And if I be Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your, ju be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. According to verse 28, he says, But if I cast out devils by what? By the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Think now. In Luke, he said he cast out devils by the finger of God. But now, in Matthew, he says he cast out devils by the Spirit of God. What then would be the finger of God? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So, did the Holy Spirit play a key part in the writing of the law of God? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because God, how did God do it? By the finger of God. Yes, Sister Jen. When he was, uh, when, the, when the one lady was uh, being, you know, was about to get her, uh, was about to be stoned in the courtyard for committing adultery and, you know, all that things. And he had knelt down and was using his finger, his literal finger, <laughs> actual physical finger, to draw in the sand. Okay, I'm not hearing you, Sister Jen. Do you have a question or you're just giving it as a statement? Okay, I think Sister Jen's gone. Whoever. Oh, no, can you hear me now? Now, now we can hear you. Okay, I apologize. Um, I believe that when he was in, you know, uh, writing in the sand with his actual finger, um, and then he stood up and he said, whoever has not committed anything, you know, uh, cast the first stone. Would you say that he was writing maybe names down as to who's doing what? <laughs> like he's the judge, like the, the finger of God was judging. Okay. Uh, um, you know, or, or, or using the law, I guess. Oh, or, oh, I don't know. Okay. I was kind of... Okay, so yeah. what's, what you're asking, Sister Jen, is that when Jesus, but by the way, what Sister Jen's asking is John chapter 8. It says that Jesus kneeled down, they brought a woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8 from verse 1 to about verse 12. And it says that when G they said to Jesus, we found this woman committing adultery and according to the law of Moses, it commands us to stone this woman. And so they threw her there. And they said, what sayest thou? In other words, what do you do? Must we stone or mustn't we stone? And now they tried to trap Jesus. The law... True. The Lord did say that if a woman was caught in committing adultery, she must be stoned. But guess what? The man must be stoned with her. So that means, obviously, they set up this woman to try and trap Jesus. The man was not there. Now, if Jesus says, yes, stone her, they were going to accuse him against to the Romans because no one had the right to kill unless they get approval of the Romans first. And that's why when the Jews wanted to kill Jesus, they had to first take him to Pilate. So Jesus was in almost a trial and trap him. If he says, don't kill, they're going to say, but this is what God says, you're going against God. If he says kill, they're going to say, you're going against the Romans. So any which way, they're trying to trap Jesus, whichever answer. So what Jesus does, he kneels and he starts writing in the sand. Do you know what Jesus wrote in the sand? If you read this, I, what is that, Sister Michelle? Their sins. They are sins. And then he stood up as their eyes fell upon, the, upon what he wrote, the sins that they were committing. He wrote each one of their sins. And as their eyes fell upon those, they looked upon those, the, the, the writing, those stones in their hands started to drop because they saw that Jesus had just perfectly described their lives. Now, I'll just give, I will just give you a verse to show you that Jesus wrote their sins. Come with me to Isaiah, Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. Now, I'm going to ask... Isaiah 65, Isaiah chapter 65, verse 6. Isaiah 65, verse 6. It says, Behold, it is written before me what was written before him, and I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into that bosom. What, as God saying, was written before him? What did he write? Verse 7. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord. So, yeah, it's talking about writing. 
And when it talks about writing in verse 7, it tells verse 6 is writing is written before the Lord. And then the next verse, verse 7, shows us it was iniquities. So when Jesus wrote on the ground, he was writing iniquities. He was writing iniquities of those people. Now come with me in your Bible to Job 33. I want to move on. This is my first point, so we can move on. Now come with me to Job 33 quickly. Job chapter 33. Job the 33rd chapter. I want us to see in Job chapter 33. I saw that the Spirit played a part in creation. I saw that the Spirit played a part in the giving of the law. Now, I wonder, did the Spirit only play a part in creating the world? Or did the Spirit also play a part in creating me, in creating you, in creating Adam and Eve? I want us to see Job 33, verse 4. Job 33, verse 4. Tell me who is the creator based upon Job 33, verse 4. It says, the Spirit of God had made me. That word made means to create. The Spirit of God had made me, and the breath of the Almighty had given me life. Now, based upon verse 4, would I be wrong to say that the Spirit of God is the Creator? Based upon Job 33, verse 4. I, I think I'm fair to say the Spirit of God is Creator. Because the Bible is saying He's Creator. And if, if a being is the Creator, that makes Him God. That makes Him God. Sister Emma? Yes, Brother Devaney, I'd like to mention back in this, after uh, God formed man out of the dust of the ground, he said um, that he breathed into his nostril the breath of life. Yes. And doesn't, doesn't this symbolize the Holy Spirit? Yes. Giving life to Given, Adam? Yes, yes. I see, there's a hand before we move on. Yes, I wanted to ask a question. Yes. Um, when Sister Emma was mentioning being born again also with the connection of sanctification. And yes. Right now, how you're talking about um, the creative power that the third person of the Godhead has. Mm. And how does this correlate with um, that statement in, in the spirit of prophecy that sanctification is the work of a lifetime? Because we still know that even when you're born of the water and the spirit and you get baptized, the work just began, you know? So can we talk about how that works with, between being fully converted and that whole word of conversion and sanctification? Okay, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's selected messages. Um, ish, can I get the page now? But let me just explain, and then if the quotation comes to mind, I will just share it. What God requires is the surrender of the heart in order for justification to take place. I think it's selected messages. Let me see if I, can, if I can just get the page for you. I think it's selected messages, book one, page 366. Selected messages. Let's try something. Let me just see if I can pull up the quotation. Um, What she says is that she says that God requires an entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And then she says, hmm, how can I forget this? It requires an entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And from that point, she says, in order to retain justification, God requires continual obedience. So what God requires for a new convert and for someone who's been converted for years. What it requires is the exact same thing. That is a, a surrender of the heart. So for someone who's been following God for 10 years, the light is brighter than for someone who's following God just for a month. But God requires the same thing for both of them, a complete surrender of all the light and truth that is shining upon them. So for someone who's just come to the truth a month, the light is not as blazing as it is for a person who's been walking 10 years in the light. But God requires exactly the same thing from both of them. That is a surrender of the heart. So for one person, a complete surrender of the heart, they might not know everything. They might still be doing things wrong. In, in that state, God still fully receives them. Why? He has not yet given them light concerning those other matters. But because he sees obedience to the light they have, God calculates in his mind obedience if they had all the light, they would be perfectly obeying it. So that's how God views it. Mm. 
So, yeah, that's why it's a work of a lifetime, meaning that should I die in that process because I've surrendered to that little light, God knows because submission is there to the little light, should there have been more light, that same submission would be there as well. And let me say this, yeah. let me say this, someone says, why doesn't God just blaze all the lights one time? Now you think of this, if somebody has been in darkness for, for a year, two years, three years, I'm saying they've been in darkness, even a month, they've been stuck in a tunnel for a month. Do you know I have seen people being rescued? Do you know what's one of the first things the rescuers do after they get, when they're getting them out now, they're coming out? Do you know that they cover their eyes, they blind them, they keep their eyes covered. But you might say, what, what are they, what, why are they doing that? Because they understand their eyes need to be gradually presented to the light. Should the light come too much upon them, they could stay permanently blind. So, and as in the natural, so in the spiritual. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. God can't give us all the lights, lest we turn away, lest we turn away. Now, you know what? I need to give you that quotation. Selected Messages, Book 1, I think it's 360. Let's see. But nonetheless, after the study, just remind me for the quotation. I would, give you, I would, I would search for it. I think it's Selected Messages, Book 1, page 360. Let's see. If I cannot find it now. Three, which... 316 or 360? 360. I think it's 360. Okay. Okay. You know what? Let me come back. I will give you the quotation because the one I gave now, it's actually talking about imputed righteousness justification. No, I will come back and I will give you the quotation. Let's just, let's, let's, let's move on. Now, I want us to see Please, if you Adventists, if you're not Adventists, please, please pardon me for reading from the Spirit of Prophecy. We're going to study the Spirit of Prophecy. Normally, I would not touch the Spirit of Prophecy in Bible studies with non-Adventists. But I believe some of you are Adventists. So for those who are not yet, by faith, receive these quotations. When we come to study the Spirit of Prophecy from the Bible, you, you would have faith that this woman was a prophet. Now, hear what she says. She says, this is from... UL, I just forget what book, it's a um, uh, devotional book. Thank you, Upward Look. She says, the eternal Godhead, the eternal, now, pause, pause, pause. I'm going to tell you, you're going to meet people that are going to tell you that the Spirit has not always existed from eternity. But I want you to understand the quotation, the eternal Godhead. What is the Godhead according to this quotation? What are they? The eternal now, who is eternal? Let's see, who I, let's see who is eternal. The prophet says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. According to inspiration, is the Holy Spirit eternal? Yes, yes he's eternal. We just saw publicly, he's the creator, he's God. We saw that in our previous study, this study we said as well, that he is the creator. Previous study, we saw the Bible calls him God in Acts 5. Now, I want you to see another quotation. Please, friends, write these quotations down. Evangelism 616. You're going to meet people that are going to tell you that the Spirit of God is not a person. But we just proved in our previous study, I gave you verses where the Spirit himself spoke and said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work whereunto I call them. So the Spirit spoke himself, said, I have called him to a special work. You cannot speak unless you are a person. The Spirit spoke and said, separate. Paul and Barnabas, we showed you the Spirit can be grieved in our previous study. Now, hear what inspiration says. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person. What is the Holy Spirit? A person. Yes, my sister? I see there's a hand up. Okay. I think that was from last time. She okay, okay, okay. One more quotation on this point. Inspiration says, the Holy Spirit is a person. Crystal clear. Red words. The Holy Spirit has a personality. Blue words. 
he must also be a divine person, else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. So I'm saying like the Bible, I gave you Bible in our previous study. Holy Spirit's a person. Now I'm showing you from the spiritual prophecy, he is a person. Okay, 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 okay. Let's, let's, let's stop there. Now remember, now you know what I realized before. Now, I hope you understand in friends, the Holy Spirit is God. Holy Spirit played a part in creation. He played a part in the giving of the law. And the Holy Spirit is verily a person we can see from Bible spiritual prophecy. Now, you know, a law study, I had mentioned that you must read Desire of Ages. I actually realized I gave the wrong pages, but I gave the right chapter. I gave the wrong pages, but I gave the right chapter. I don't know if you all read it, but I want us to see in the, somebody at Ox and... I, so, sorry, I read it. I was wondering about that because I was like, hmm, how is this? this okay, <laughs> sorry, I, I had given the wrong pages. I apologize. I gave the wrong pages, but it was the right chapter. Um, the chapter that I gave you, I'll let not your heart be troubled. That was the right chapter. Now, the sin against the Holy Spirit, remember we had explained it, that the sin against the Holy Spirit is the only sin that cannot be forgiven. That is the unpardonable sin. That when you commit that sin, there's no forgiveness of that sin. And we explained last time that the work of the Spirit is to convict me of sin. Of sin. So whatever he convicts me of, and I choose not to surrender that sin, every time he convicts me and convicts me and convicts me, and I choose not to surrender it, what the Bible likens that to? The Bible calls that basically the sin against the Holy Spirit. As a, it's a persistent refusal to surrender the sin to, to the Holy Spirit. And should I die in that state, I have died committing the unpardonable sin. And it can be any sin. I just want to give a quotation. This is Bible Commentary 1093. It says, against the Holy Ghost, the sin against the Holy Ghost, the prophet says, no one need look upon the sin against the Holy Ghost as something mysterious, and in the indefinable, you cannot define it. She's saying we, we can define it and it's not mysterious. Then what is the sin against the Holy Ghost? The sin against the Holy Ghost is the sin of persistent refusal to respond to the invitation to repent. So what is the sin against the Holy Spirit? As I continue, every time he convicts me to repent and I choose not to do it, I, I am I'm coming closer and closer to the unpardonable sin. I am coming closer and closer to the unpardonable sin. So I hope those things is clear. This is things we have covered before in previous studies and our last study. What I want us to do now, very quickly, and then we would, we would come to the conclusion. I want us to look now at two things, at two things. Maybe before I look at these two things, Maybe just I want to mention this before we look at these two things. Does anybody know what is Jesus doing for us today? What is Jesus doing for us today in heaven? Yes, is he there? Is interceding for Amen. Us. He's interceding. He's interceding. I don't know how many of us know, but do you know that the Spirit of God also intercedes for us? But he does not intercede as Jesus intercedes. Jesus intercedes before, with, for us before the Father. But the Holy Spirit intercedes differently. I want you to see publicly how does he intercede. That means he... he, he let's see, let's see, let's see. Interesting. Come with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I want you to see how does the Spirit of God intercede for us. Romans chapter 8 verse 26. Romans 8, verse 26. Take note what the Bible says in Romans 8, verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. So the Spirit helps our infirmities. What is infirmity? Does anybody know it's infirmity? Our weakness. It says, The Spirit of God, or the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 
So the Bible says that the Spirit, because we don't know what to pray for, the Spirit of God intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. That cannot be uttered. He makes intercession. Now let me say this. My understanding of Him making intercession for us, I, 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 I don't see the Spirit of God interceding for us in the sense that He prays for us. I don't see it as that. How I see it is that he moves upon my heart and he flashes into my mind things what I ought to pray for. Because should I be left to myself, I would not know how to pray for. So he moves upon the heart. And what, it, what the Bible says with groanings that cannot be uttered, I don't know if you've ever had experiences, but I have had experiences where I've come before God and I was, not be, I, I was unable to speak a word. But I just cried and cried and cried just cried on my knees, realizing how weak and sinful I am, realizing my great need for Jesus. And I, have, I, I tell you those, not to say I never ever uttered a word in there, I did say a few things, but those were some of the best prayers. You say, why is that? Because when I woke up off my knees, I felt forgiven, I felt refreshed, I felt accepted of God, I felt that my sins were pardoned. I'm saying with such prayers, we have the assurance that God has heard us. And we can be assured that that prayer was breathed by the Spirit of God. Because never can we feel, I'm saying never can we feel the fact that I'm feeling guilt, the fact that I have conviction and, I'm, and I realize what I've done is wrong as an indication the Spirit of God is moving on the heart. That, that is one of the most, friends, if, if that stops with us, we are doomed. We are doomed. We are doomed. We are doomed. Now, what I want us to do I want us to look at two things. I want us to look at two things. What the Spirit of God does, there are two things that it does for God's church and for us as individuals. The Spirit of God gives gifts. He gives gifts. That means to every believer that is converted and comes into the body of of, of God's remnant church, God gives them some sort of gift. The Spirit actually, the Bible says the Spirit himself, he divides and he chooses what gift to give to what person. Prior to my conversion, I could teach no one. I was not, I, I was, I, that was not, I, I never have that. I couldn't, I was, that was not me. But when I got converted, I found out that that's the gift that God had given to me to teach. So I believe that God gives us gifts. Even we couldn't do things before. When we come to the truth, God gives you a gift. I want you to see that God gives gifts. But there's a gift within the Christian world that is most prominent. I'm saying within today. Today is most prominent and the most conf- mostly co- people are confused over this one gift. It's called the gift of tongues. The Christian world is confused over this gift. So we're going to have to look and see. I'm not going to deal with all gifts. You just read all gifts. But I want to specifically deal with that gift, the gift of tongues. Because people are really confused. So, you know what, let's do this. Come with me. Now, wait, wait, before we move on, before we go on. Does anybody know why the Spirit of God gives gifts? What, I'm saying, why, why does it give gifts? Does anyone want to... Sorry? To enhance the church. To enhance the church, the building up of God's kingdom. Amen. Building up of God's kingdom, enhancing the church. Powerful. Powerful. That's true. That and that is true. Anyone else wants to take a try? What 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 come with me to Ephesians? Come with me to Ephesians. Come with me. That is true. That is so true. Come with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I want us to read from Ephesians 4, verse 8. Ephesians 4, verse 8. Um, Sister Simone, you can read that for us. Ephesians 4, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity. So thank you, Amen. So it says that when Jesus ascended up on high, He gave gifts unto men. I want you to see what gifts He has given. Now I'm going to say this. I'm going to read another verse, 
and we're going to show that the person who really who chooses what gift to have, I'm going to show you as the Spirit of God. But for now, let's just see what are the gifts that are given and what's the purpose of the gifts. Let's see. I'm going to skip all the verses and I'm going straight to the gifts now. Verse 11, verse 12, verse 13. Verse 11 and 12, I'm going to get, the, I'm going to get verse 11, the gifts. Verse 12, I'm going to get the reason for the gifts. Look at verse 11. It says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and then it says, and teachers. Why has God given these things? Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. It says, For the perfecting of the saints, and for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, now let's pause there. Let's pause there. Tell me what, according to verse 12, was one of the main reasons. There are many reasons there for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But what is the first reason given in verse 12 for the purpose of the gifts? Perfecting of the saints. Perfecting of the saints. Amen. So God chooses to give gifts because he wants his church to come to perfection. And the gifts are to help, not to glorify the man or the woman who has the gift. Mm -mm. It is to build up the church, to bring the church to perfection. Both the teacher, both the apostle, both the prophet, everyone. All of them to grow together and come into perfection. So that's the purpose of the gifts. We read some of the gifts. But who gives the gifts? Um, yes. Simone? Spirit. But yes? Even, isn't the, the main purpose um, why we've been provided with these gifts, isn't it to equip us? To glorify God in everything that we do. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yes, God has everything. Whatever God gives us, everything God gives us is for His glory. Whether it's life, whether it's the gift of speech, whether it's time, whether it's money, everything we have is for one great purpose: is to glorify God. That is true, and to bless humanity. Those are the two main purposes: glorify God and bless humanity. That's true. Come with me in your Bible. Come with me in your Bible now to First Corinthians. Chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, do you know there are some chapters that inspiration says must be memorized? Put entire chapters. Remember I shared with you all, Isaiah 51, remember that? Inspiration says must be memorized, the whole chapter. Maybe one day I will share with you all the chapters she says must be memorized. And I'm saying, if you're going to start memorizing, start there. I'm saying because God knows what he says. If he says memorize this, that's the best place to start. But just throw a hint. 1 Corinthians 12 is so important. And chapter 13, that God says both these chapters must be in our memory. Entire chapters. Entire chapters. But nonetheless, let's move on. 1 Corinthians 12. I want us to see in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. You know what? Before I read this, lest I forget, do you know there's a difference between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit? There's a difference. The, the, gift, the gifts of the Spirit, I can't have all gifts. I can't. God's not giving one man or one woman all gifts. No, no, no. He's not doing that. He splits up the gifts. But do you know that the fruit of the Spirit, every one of us must have all of them. There's no, we can't say, I want, you know what's interesting? When we go to the fruits of the Spirit, by the way, does anybody know how many fruits there are of the Spirit? Nine. Nine. You know how the Bible says it? I'm going to show you the verse. It says, but the fruit, not fruits, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and then it starts mentioning love, joy, peace. No, it doesn't say fruits. It says fruits. That means in this one fruit, you have love. In that, like, have you ever taken a fruit? Inside that fruit, there's vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin this, vitamin that. So the fruit of the Spirit is one. But when you bite it, you get in love in it. You get in joy. You get in, you get in, you get in everything in one bite. So you can't say, I only want this fruit, I only want that fruit, or I only got these fruits, I don't have that fruit. Uh -uh. You must have all or you have nothing. That's how it works. But we'll go to the verse. Sister Emma? So you can equate the um, 
the um, gifts of the Spirit as talents mm. and the fruit of the Spirit as character. That's it. That's it. That's mm. powerful. Yeah. Thank you, Sister Emma. So what Sister Emma is saying, that is so true. The gifts are talents, but the fruits of the Spirit is character. Sister, Sister Jen? What if we don't even know what the gift you know, if some people, do some people not ever receive a gift of the Spirit from, you know, they don't even know what... Sister Emma, I mean Sister Jen, Sister Jen, that's a powerful question. That's powerful. Yeah. So Wednesday night prayer meeting is tomorrow. You need to, you need to, be, you need to study with us. It's going to be on. Okay. So we're going to touch... How do we, we, get, no, do we do that? <laughs> it's going to be on YouTube. <laughs> it's going to be on YouTube. So you're going to watch it. It's not a full yeah. study on that, but it's, 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 it's going to direct you in the part to find what I would call... I call it the life work. The life work. Mm. Because your life work has to be in harmony with the gift God has given you. Now, inspiration calls it the life work. And you can never... I'm just saying... If God has given you this gift, let's just say the gift of teaching, what are you doing? Being a something else. I'm saying your gift must be in harmony with your life work. So whatever your gift, whatever you, I'm saying your gift and your life work it has to be in harmony. So in order to understand what's your gift, you must first understand your life work. You must understand your life work. But inspiration directs us on a part on how to find your life work. And there's an entire chapter. Don't, I'm not going to go further there. Please watch the study. Come with us, prayer meeting. Watch, and you're gonna, it's going to direct you on a part on how to find your life work and understand your gift, basically. Okay. Sister Kiwana? Yes, I think I yes. figured it out yet. <laughs> not figured it out yet. Okay, <laughs> okay. Now, I, I'm going to give you a homework, Sister Chen. Please, there's your homework. There's your homework. If you, you have not yet figured it out, read Education. The chapter is entitled Life Work. The chapter is entitled Life Work. That's the chapter. I happen to have her book too, so I will okay. definitely look that, read okay. that today. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sister Kiwana first, our sister, and then Keisha. Um, I just wanted to say that one of the encouragements we're not hearing you. We, we can hear? Yeah. A little bit better. Um, a word of encouragement concerning knowing your gift. It's really, I don't think people would know. It is displayed um, in the beginning of your birth, throughout your whole life. When we come to know the truth and we ask the Holy Spirit to show us through experiences that we what do in our lives and treat the gift that we um, he has given us. Um, for example, my gift is wisdom, and through that I was able to to know and um, through my experience, I always used to question things, and I see that in the Bible it says exactly what I was questioning about. So it's very important that we ask and then we also be watchful because we ask but then we care about our lives and not actually think we can bypass us but then we don't know we ask the same thing. Thanks. Thank you, my sister. Um, Sister Ruth and my sister, do you, do you have questions? If it's, sta if it's statements, I'm going to say preserve it for the end. Okay, if you have a question, you can ask quickly. It's kind of a personal question, brother. Um, but in South Africa, did you find any institutions to help you, like Seventh day Adventist institutions to help you? Because I'm from South Africa, and I okay. don't remember. 
Okay. Yeah, like, if there was any, so would you mind sharing? Okay. What I'm going to say currently, um, no, I did not go to any institution. I did not go to any institution. All I had was the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, and God was teaching. God was teaching. And obviously, I came across some prison truth teachers also. And I, I learned, I learned, I learned um, a lot from them. But that is the reason why we are starting an institution. I know there, are, there is one prison truth institution in South Africa. I believe it's... Oh, there is. Yes, there is. I believe it's called Pure Light, if I'm not mistaken. It's a school, a prison truth school. Yes, yes. So the purpose, we are also establishing a school, but they are, they, their purpose is to teach pastors, basically to make, take men that come there and train them for year studies, but we're not going to do it like that. We, we're going to be squash it up into a two-month training, two-month training and with, with, with the truth. But yes, there is a prison truth school. I know of one. Yep, in South Africa, we would be most probably the second one. Okay, Sister Ruth, and then Sister Keisha, quick questions. Yeah, it's just a quick one. Um, which book um, did you say the Life of Chapter was from? Education. 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 Okay. Yes. Thanks. Sister Keisha. Thank you. I just want to know what time is the prior meeting tomorrow, please. Okay, I can share with you our time. I'm not sure what time it's going to be in your time zone. In our time zone, it's going to be half past six. So you Did would you say six thirty. Yes, p.m. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. We 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 in First Corinthians chapter twelve. First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse verse four, verse four. It says, "But there are diversity of gifts, but the same spirits." So it says there are many diversity of gifts, but what? The same spirit. There are differences of administration, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operation, but the same God which worketh in all. Now watch verse 7. Watch verse 7. Tell me who gives the gifts. It says, but the manifest manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So question, how much... Can a person be converted without the Spirit? Impossible. The Bible says the Spirit of God is given to every man. And when the Spirit is given to you through conversion, the Spirit brings you to a place of conversion. What comes with that? Look at verse 8. This is just some of the things. This is not an exhaustive list. It says in verse 8, For one is given, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gift of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally, as, take note, ye will. That's the spirit wills. So the spirit chooses what gift he gives to anyone. He is the one that decides who gets what gift. Who gets what gift. That is done by the spirit. That is done by the spirit. So these are the gifts of the spirit. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I thought I just went off. Okay. Now, I see there's an answer to the root before I continue. Okay, maybe your hand was just up by mistake. Now, I want to deal with this issue of tongues because we saw that tongues is a part of the gifts. I want to deal with the issue of tongues. Come with me in your Bible to Acts. Now, I'm going where we first see tongues in the New Testament. I'm going there. Let's go to where we first see tongues in the New Testament. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts, the second chapter. Now, there's confusion with this gift. Much, much, much confusion. Um, before I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I used to just go to church for the sake of going, and I used to go to a church now and again just to make, tell God that I do think I would just to, you know, that, that to say, God, you know, I, I do think about you, and I would just go for my conscience sake. And I would just go, and when I used to go, I used to, hear, I used to hear what I thought at that time was the gift of tongues. Was, oh, what, what is that? No, they're speaking in the gift of tongues. They have the gift of tongues. So 
that, that, that's what I first saw. But when I became Adventist and I started reading and learning, I realized what I thought, it's not true. Now let's see what is tongues. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Let's start maybe in verse 1. Acts chapter 2 from verse 1. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled, the whole, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. So the Holy Spirit falls down, and he falls down in fire like tongues of fire over the disciples. Now watch verse 4. Watch the, as we continue reading now. Verse 4 says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here you can see that they, they have the gift of tongues. Whatever it is, they have the gift of tongues. And the Spirit gave them that gift. Sister Emma, before we continue. So the gift of tongues was basically fluency in different languages to preach the gospel to other other nations. Amen. Let's see that publicly now. What Sister Emma said is true. Now we want to see if what Emma said, let's test her with the Bible. Let's test her with the Bible. Now let's see verse 5. Verse 5 is almost injecting something so that we can understand why the gift of tongues. It says in verse 5, And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, take note, out of every nation under heaven. Pause. At this time, at this feast, who was at Jerusalem? Jews that were from where? Every nation under heaven. They had just come to Jerusalem for the sake of the, the, the feast. That's why they were there. But they are coming from every other nation. Now, do you know every, na every nation has its own tongue? When I say tongue, mm -hmm. I mean language. South Africa, the main language besides English is Zulu. In different parts of the African continent, they, they have their own, their own specific language. But nonetheless, I'm just saying that. Let's see what the Bible says. Let's see what the Bible says. Now, verse 6. I'm suggesting tongues are different languages, but let's see what the Bible says. Verse 6. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. They were amazed. Why? Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Can you hear what the Bible is saying? Mm -hmm. They all heard them speak in their own language. Who was there at Jerusalem? Every nation. Every nation. Now, if you can see, can someone read for us from verse 7 to verse 9? Actually, from 7 to verse 11. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Mm. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia, Phygeria and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Creeds and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Pause. And mention all these different nations, and then it concludes in verse 11 saying, We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. What are they talking about? We hear them speak. Have you ever heard someone ask, What is your mother tongue? I don't know if it's just in South Africa, but if it's also around the world. Have you ever heard someone, What is your mother tongue? Do you know what they mean when they say, What is your mother tongue? Your language. What is your language? Your first main language. 
So very clear tongues is basically when, now let me say this. Back then, there were 12 disciples. What was their mission? To take the gospel to the world. Now think of it. They were going to have to go to different nations. These are unlearned disciples. It would have taken them, it would have took them years to learn the language of the people before they could preach the gospel. So what God does, he fast forwards for them and he downloads into their mind the gift of tongues. So now they can speak any language fluently, fluently. So this is what God done for what purpose? To hasten the proclamation of the gospel to the entire world. Now someone says, is God giving the gift of tongues today? Okay, I'm, I'll come to Sister Emma. I'm going to say, let, let me say it like this. What God, because today God has believers in every nation, that means he has believers in Egypt, he has believers in Africa, he has believers in America, he has wherever China, he has some true believer there. So you know what God does? He uses the people within that locality to reach the people there. So the gift of tongues is not as fluent as God gave it back then. I'm saying God just poured it upon the disciples. But not so now. Why? He already has people in every nation. So it's not so, it's not so much of an urgency for God to give us that gift. But I'm saying he can still give us if, 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 if need demands. Sister Emma? Um, I would like to just add to what you mentioned now about uh, tongues, the gift of tongues. The Holy Spirit, we just read a few minutes ago that the Holy Spirit gives gifts. Mm. And one of these gifts is he gives to people, the, the, to various people, the ability, the capacity to learn languages quickly. Mm. Mm. And, you know, like for, and for others, he gives the gift of te teaching or yes. you know, speaking. And yes. Even in our day, he gives the gift of um, learning languages quickly to various people to, to accomplish that work. Mm. Thank, thank, yes, that's true. That is so true, Sister Emma. I want to come to the conclusion of this matter. Let's just read and then we, we're going to conclude. Let's just read. Come to Galatians 5. Just read quickly the fruits of the Spirit. Now, there's a difference between the gifts and the fruits. Count me to Galatians chapter 5. Now, I don't know if you'll know this, friends, but if you go to the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul mentions the gifts and basically he, he, he rebukes, there's almost a rebuke in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to the, to the believers there because they, there was almost a fight amongst them about, for gifts. There, was, there seemed to be coveting of the gifts. And then Paul gives almost a rebuke there. And then do you know how he concludes 1 Corinthians chapter 12? After he mentions all the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, he concludes, he says, I'm going to show you a better way. Something more better than all these gifts. That's his conclusion in chapter 12, the last verse. He says, I'm going to show you a better way. And then in chapter 13, do you know what he starts speaking about, which he says is better than all the gifts? He speaks of love. love. He says, love suffers long. Because in verse 1 and 2 and 3, he says, though I have the gift of tongues, he mentions that, he says, and, and I don't have love, he says, I become a sounding brass or tingling symbol. He says, though I have the gift of prophecy, I understand all mysteries, have all knowledge and all faith, and have not love. He says, I am nothing. He then, the next verse 3, he says, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Hospitality, the gift of giving. And though I give my own body to be burned in the fire, and have not love. He says, it profited me nothing. Then he explains. So he says, all the gifts without love is useless. And then he says, love suffers long, it's kind. Doesn't envy. Vents yet not itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemingly. It is not selfish, it doesn't seek its own. It's not easily. Actually, inspiration says it's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. Endures all things. Hope at all things. Charity, love, never fails. He says, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But he says, love will not go away. Do you know that all gifts are going to stop? You know when Jesus comes, when that which is perfect, he says, has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. What's in part? The gifts. 
So as much as I should covet gifts, Paul says, yes, good, good. But he says the gifts are not going to always, always, always exist. When Jesus comes, there's no need for prophecy. There's no need for faith. Why? Because Jesus is in front of me. I don't need to have faith. He says all the gifts will soon vanish. But he says one thing continues on forever. You know what is that one thing? It is love. love. It's love. Do you know inspiration teachers? And you know how Paul concludes? He says, now they abided, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now they abided faith, hope, and charity, these three things. But the greatest of these is love, is charity. Do you know when you read these Five ages and volume two of the testimonies, we are told that when Jesus went through Calvary, Gethsemane, hope did not present itself to him. Inspiration says, okay, are you all hearing me? In inspiration says that faith trembled. It says the dying son of God in volume 2, she says he was assailed with doubts. The dying son of God on the cross was assailed with doubts. She says faith trembled. Hope did not present itself as if he was coming out alive. Jesus could not see through the portals of the tomb. So hope and faith trembles. But guess what? She says his love <laughs> works stronger and stronger. So faith and hope trembles, but what happens? Love doesn't go away. His love becomes stronger and stronger. Friends, do you understand how important? Oh, what happened? Ish. Ish. Recording in progress. Come back. He's back. Okay. I, I'm not sure what happened. See, Satan don't like when you speak about love, he hates love. Oh friends. Because love is gonna cause us to stop committing sin. He hates this thing, love, and he just shut me off quickly. <laughs> but God put me back quickly. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> let's let let's, <laughs> let's read the fruit of the spirit and then we we, we can we can conclude. Sister Jen, okay. Let's read the fruit of the spirit. No, uh, okay. Sorry. Okay, let's read Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and then we, we can conclude. I think my time's up. Um, Galatians 5, 22. Now, this is the fruit, not the gifts, but the fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, key, what's first there? It's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So when it says against such there is no law, that means you cannot be condemned. If you have this, the law cannot condemn you. The law cannot. Against such there is no law. So what the Bible is saying, with these things you can have and have and have. There's no stopping point. You just keep getting them. You, can, you don't have to say I need to be temperate on these things. No, no. You can have them in abundance and even more abundance. So these are the fruits of the Spirit, and every one of us, in order to be saved, must develop such characteristics. We must all have such characteristics. Now, what I'm going to do is, I was thinking of studying with us the early and the latter rain, but I realized that it's going to be too advanced for these studies, because it requires to understand the investigative judgments, and we're not, we haven't even touched the investigative judgments. So I'm going to stop here. There is more even here, but I think we get, this is enough. I think we, we get the crux of it. We get the crux of the matter. So I'm going to stop here on the study of the Holy Spirit. But God willing, we would, if, if we might study the early and the latter rain and look at it, that has to do with the Spirit of God. But yeah, we'll just stop here. Okay, Sister Jen, before we pray, and then Sister Emma, and then I, I would close, we would close in prayer. Um, earlier when you had mentioned about baptism and you said that we need the Holy Spirit before uh, before we actually do the act of yes. um, you know, baptism yes. in the water, yes. um, I was wondering what if somebody had already done it the other way around where they were baptized first and then started to change. I mean, like I, I already had, for, I'm talking for myself, I already had been convicted and I felt that I needed to be baptized. So I felt the Holy Spirit drove me or led me to baptism. Then I got baptized with some knowledge, not all knowledge, but some knowledge. And then afterwards, I fully converted or, you know, 
I feel like I've been, you know, I gave up needs and I did all these other things. So is that, is that wrong or should I be rebaptized? Okay. What, what, what I would say is, um, Sister Chen, that you, no one needs all knowledge before baptism. You don't need all knowledge. Okay, great. Yes, That's good to know. <laughs> because <laughs> I don't even have all knowledge today. I'm still learning. So no, all knowledge is not. But I would say, based upon Jesus, that there can be no baptism until teaching first. That's Jesus' own words. I can show you that in Matthew 28. He says, teaching them to observe all things. Teaching them to observe. So you must be taught. And as I see, somebody is observing them. They, are, they get taught and they start to observe. Observe means they start doing what they get taught. Then Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So in Jesus' understanding, I'm saying based on Jesus, you first get taught, then you observe, and then you get baptized. So that's the order. That's the order. There are basic truths. Yes, amen. Amen. Okay. I was going to read something that shows the danger, but I'll read it another time when we study baptism. The danger of baptizing people who are not being taught and are unconverted is a danger. And that's actually, inspiration says that we are so in tears within the church when we do things like that. We are so in tears. Yeah. So I will read it, I will read it in a future study, the danger of that. Okay, I'm not going to say, there's actually something else she says, but I, I, will, I will leave it now lest we get afraid. Now, is there any... Oh, <laughs> Um, Sister Emma, and then we'll conclude with prayer. Yes, um, so I would like to say to you, Brother Devani, thank you very much for sharing your experience. Praise God. Of, um, of prayer when you come into God's presence. Mm. Because it happens to me too. Mm. And I thought that there was something wrong with me. I would come in prayer, close my eyes. And I wouldn't know what to pray for. And the only thing I could say to God is just, Father. And then I would start crying and I said, I'd not be able to ask him anything. Mm. And I would just, with my eyes closed, I would say, Father, Father, Father. And then I would just start crying. Mm. And uh, I'm glad that you shared that because mm. I didn't know whether... I was missing something or whether there was something wrong with me or I just didn't know I was confused mm. but it just pulled on the, on the cord of my heart when I heard you say that mm. and um, I, I understand mm. I understand no we praise, we praise God sister Emma praise God praise God Okay, let me conclude on this point. Let me conclude on this point. I want to conclude here. Yeah? How do I get the Spirit? You know, we, we studied wonderful things about the Spirit. But someone says, you know, I've heard these wonderful things. I, 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 I'm, I'm literally now craving for, I'm craving for what, what we studied. I don't know about you, but I have, sometimes when I hear some beautiful truths, I crave for that experience. I say I want this experience. It's like when I can smell food. Maybe I can, someone's making so I can smell it. And what starts happening, things happen within the stomach. And my stomach, I, I'm craving for that thing. Now it's healthy food, healthy food. Start craving for it. So I'm sure there might be some craves within some people's hearts, some people's minds. What we study, they're saying, I want this experience. I want the Holy Spirit. I want to have love. I want to have joy. I want to, how, do I, how do I get the Spirit? How do I get, I want, I want this new birth experience daily. How do I get these things? I'm going to show you two ways you can get it. Well, sorry, two ways you can get the Spirit of God. There are two ways. First way, first way, I want you to see the first way. Come with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Then I'm going to show you the second way. Luke chapter 11. Luke, the 11 chapter. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke 11, verse 13. 
It says in Luke, the 11th chapter, verse 13, If ye, if ye, then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, that's Jesus speaking, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So he's saying that if parents are evil and they give good gifts, he's saying how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them that ask of him for the Spirit. And what James says is that you, you receive not because you ask not. James tells us the reason why you don't have is because you are not asking. So number one, make it your duty that when you fall upon your knees, when you speak to God, ask. Now, friends, you know, there's many wonderful things. I was sharing with our, our, our little group. I said there's many wonderful things to ask God for. We can ask God for patience. We can ask God for faith. We can ask God for all these wonderful different characteristics, mercy, goodness, all these things that God has. We can ask him for that. But I said, friends, let me say this. If you have the spirit of God, you are getting all those things with the spirit of God. You would get the love. You will get the goodness. You'll get the meekness. You'll get the patience. So I'm saying what the spirit of God flows every other gift, flows every other gift. So we must ask, number one. Number two is when you ask, don't just ask, there's a condition of receiving. I want you to see the condition. Come with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 5. And then I want to conclude with this. Maybe I'll, let's go to Acts 5. Let's go to Acts 5. Come with me to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Acts 5. What's happening? Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Let's go to Acts 5. I want us to see Acts, the fifth chapter. Now, in Acts 5, I want us to read Acts chapter 5. Before I tell you the verse, I want you to look at this quotation first. Then I tell you the verse. Can someone tell me what's the purpose of the gifts? Can, can you remember what's the, pup, the main purpose of the gifts in according to Ephesians? It's the perfection or the perfecting of the saints. Now tell me what's the highest of all gifts we could solicit from the Father. Look at the quote. Amen. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he, Jesus, could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. So the highest of all gifts, friends, I'm telling you, is asking God for his spirits. Now, maybe I'll leave that quotation. I want, you, I want us to Let's read a verse, and then I'll conclude on this quotation. Let's read a verse. Acts 5, verse 32. Acts 5, verse 32. If I want the Spirit of God, I ox, number one. And number two, what then of thy ox? It says, and, it says, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God had given to them that obey him. So how do I get... If I, if I ask, my next step is, if I want the Spirit of God, I must be willing to obey all that the Spirit of God reveals to me. If I do that, the Spirit of God comes in different measures, in different doses. If as in the first dose when he comes and I'm willing to do what he says, I get more. If I'm willing to do what he says, I get more. Now, if I had more time, I would show you that publicly. I would give you verses for that and we would walk through that. The more I obey, the more I'm given. The more I obey, the more I'm given. God's not going to give me the Spirit in abundance when, when He gives me the Spirit in a little measure, I'm not willing to obey. So it's as I obey, God gives me more of the Spirit. Now, concluding, I conclude, I conclude right here, and then I pray. I conclude, and then I pray. It says, Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to His church, and the promise belongs to us as much as to the first disciples. But like every other promise, it is given on, what is that word there? On what? Conditions. So, in order to get the Spirit of God, she's saying there are conditions like every promise, this condition. Then the prophet continues, it says, There are many who believe and profess to claim the Lord's promise. They talk about Christ and about the Holy Spirit and receive no benefits. 
Why is it that they talk about Jesus and the Spirit and they receive no benefits? Look what she says. They do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agencies. Are you hearing that, friends? Why they don't get the Spirit? They do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by divine agencies. We cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit, God works in His people to will and to do of His good pleasure. Now, yeah, there's blue words. But many will not submit to this. You know what's the problem with some of us? We are stubborn. We don't know how to submit. And because of that, that is why there's no Holy Spirit. They want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Only those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for His guidance and grace, is the Spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promised blessing, claimed by faith, brings all other blessings in its train. That's powerful. The lost, that lost, the lost parts of that, that when I get this gift, the Spirit, she says, brings all other blessings in its train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and He is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. That is powerful, friends. That is powerful. So God wants to give us this gift, but we must be willing to submit. We must be willing to submit. Now, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to pray. We're going to close. Our last two, this study and the previous study, we have studied the Holy Spirit. In our next study, we are shifting gears. Now we're going to be studying the sanctuary. And tomorrow night prayer meeting is going to start off that study because tomorrow prayer meeting is on the sanctuary as much as the life work. So it's going to set us up for our study. So those who can should watch that study. It's going to set us up for our, our, our studies now. We are going forward onto the sanctuary and then we're going to study the three angels' messages and we'll conclude on the third angel. So, yeah, I'm going to pray now. I hope the study was clear to me. It was a very simple study. And, yeah, let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Would someone like to close in prayer for us? I could pray. Let us pray. Okay. Eternal Father in heaven, I just want to thank you, God, for this platform. I want to thank you for the message we received today, God. It was truly edifying, and I just pray that, mighty God, with the help of your Holy Spirit, you will help us to put these things in action and to pray for mm, your Holy Spirit and Lord. to allow your Holy Spirit to come in our lives, Father God, to change us, to truly mm. surrender unto you. Father, I thank you and ask you to continue to bless your son, brother Deveni, Father. And as we leave, mighty God, may we leave and put these things into practice, continue to be with all his plans as he commit them unto you, mm. Father. And Lord, I lift up our hearts and I ask you to take it and teach us and instruct us yes, how you Lord. want us to live, how you want us to go. Help us to prepare as I came on. I heard Sister Michelle talking about food shortages, Lord. Let us not look and not take heed, Father, but let us be wise. Mm. I thank you, I glorify your name, and I praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But all the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king. And I shall see